Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for hanging in there for the second day of our Veterans Summit. Um, just from the comments I've heard so far, people seem to be really um, learning a lot. I know I am. I learned a huge amount yesterday. Um, thanks in no small part to our, our, our speaker, who you're going to hear from again today on military credit, uh, Dwayne Short. Uh, my job is basically to introduce Dwayne and be the gopher for the workshop. So, um, and to remind you to fill out your evaluations after after it's over. Um, this session is being recorded, as um, our MC pointed out, uh, so that it will be available for future reference or for those people who wanted to attend and couldn't. Um, once we get that information uh, on the website, um, we'll send you out an email so that you can access uh, the information. So with no further ado, let me um, introduce Dwayne. Uh, Dwayne Short is um, uh, a PhD and a professor and articulation officer at San Diego Miramar College. Um, he teaches aviation operations and um, is a very active participant in student veteran activities on campus and throughout the state. Um, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, I was talking to Jeff Spano, who's our dean over veteran services in the chancellor's office, and, um, and he tells me that Dwayne is his absolute go-to guy on any, sh any issue related to veterans. Um, you know, he pretty much says if Dwayne thinks it's a great idea, it happens, and, and if, if Dwayne thinks it's, it's not a good idea, then he knows that, you know, he's got to change something in, in our state pol policy. Um, Dwayne uh, presents regularly on the issues of military credit and in higher education, and he just recently retired from the Navy Reserve with af after 24 years of active and reserve military service as a, a naval flight officer, instructor, operations manager, and legal officer. Um, he earned his uh, BA in political science and psychology from Stanford, not too far from here. Um, his MBA in uh, management from San Diego State University and his doctorate in public administration from North Central. So with that, I will be quiet and let Dwayne do some talking. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, it sounds a lot better than it really is. I don't know that whole thing about Jeff asking me about things. It feels like, uh, you know, <laughs> Jeff asks me something, I tell him it's a bad idea or a good idea, and he, you know, whatever. It doesn't necessarily matter. So, um, hi, I'm Dwayne. Um, I'll be presenting today on, uh, on uh, uh, academic counseling, really um, the transfer of coursework for military and veteran students. Uh, next slide, please. This is what I'd like to cover uh, at the beginning. First, I'd like to learn uh, who's here. Uh, so that I know uh, what the audience is. So who here is a counselor that works with veterans? Okay, about half of you. And who here is a classroom instructor, classroom faculty member? Okay, uh, and who here is like a veterans, uh, uh, veteran certifying official or an evaluator, or somebody that works with credit in other ways? Okay, okay, good. So we've got kind of a mix, that's great. Um, as we go through, please make sure that you ask uh, questions while I'm on the point. I like, I, I prefer to do this more informally and we have a small group, which is great. Um, so if you have questions about a slide that we get to, just stop and ask me. Does anyone have any burning questions right now that they want to make sure I cover? Not that I'm necessarily going to cover them, but I know what to gloss over or lie about or whatever when we're in. Anybody have anything they definitely want to make sure they learn this morning? Yes, sir. I saw you yesterday. I was wondering, do you need an interrupter today? I, I, you, you can be my interrupter. That'd be great. <laughs> well, it was funny in the presentation yesterday because um, David, you know, mostly made it, and I collaborated a little bit, and then we didn't really figure out who was going to do what part. So I just said, well, I'll just interrupt whenever I have anything to say. <laughs> but yes, you can be my interrupter. That would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we'll be covering military transcripts. Yeah, ACE transcripts, smart transcript. Yep. Okay. Um, all right, so we've already done introduction. Here's my disclaimers. I, am, I do not perceive myself as being an expert on this. Uh, the, only, the, the reason I'm here to talk to you about it is uh, I'm an articulation officer, and at one of our articulation officer get-togethers get four years ago, maybe, um, we started talking about military credit and how does, you know, because there's a lot of military students coming back, and they have credit from uh, their smart transcripts and so on. And, we start talking about how that's going to work for transfer and how does it work for satisfying requirements. And there were a lot of questions, and we all were all sitting around shrugging at each other, going, "I don't know, I don't know." No one knew. 
So they go, well, Dwayne, um, you used to be in the military, you know, and you're still a reservist. Uh, you must know all about this. And I said, oh, I know nothing about it. You know, why would I know about this? And they go, well, I I you're the best we have, so go figure it out. So, <laughs> so I had to go. I, I learned what I could, and then I presented the next year at our SEAC conference. And since then, I've been presenting the same thing, um, you know, updating it and presenting it. So that's why I'm here. It's not because I necessarily because I work in this field. I'm just a a regular old articulation officer, but I have looked into this, and this is this is what I found. And my other disclaimer is, um, you might have come with some questions or some information that you're going to want to know. Uh, some of those will be answered, some of those probably won't be answered, and you'll probably leave with other questions. So uh, you know, don't feel like you're going to leave all satisfied and you know everything. You'll probably leave with some other some other questions, but hopefully they're on more important topics. All right, next slide. Okay, so here's what I'd like to talk about. I'm probably, uh, I'm going to gloss over the part on military students because that was covered so well by um, Marshall yesterday and uh, it will probably also be covered with the veterans panel, you'll get to um, meet some. Uh, but I will talk about this, sources and uses of credit, we're going to talk about military training, so what is military training and what does that result in, in credit or how can that result in credit at college. Military experience, which is like work experience, what you did in the military for your job, which some institutions uh, uh, award credit for it. We'll, we'll talk about what I call military-friendly institutions. So these are places that um, try to uh, do things to support uh, the military and uh, easy transfer of credit. And we'll talk about the SOC system in that in that regard. And then uh, prior learning assessments. So those are things like um, AP and ID might be examples, but there are some that uh, military students often take, like uh, CLEP exams and DSSP Dante's exams. So we'll talk about those. And then some best practices. Next slide. Okay, military students, this is the part we'll gloss over. Next slide. Uh, those are the military services, as we learned yesterday. This is like a review from yesterday. Next slide. But not as good, because Marshall did it so well. Um, reserve components. You know, uh, um, at Miramar, we have lots and lots of military students and uh, veteran students, because we're real close to the Miramar uh, Air Station. Uh, and we also, it turns out a lot of people that were active duty or reserve or affiliated with the military in other ways after they leave active duty. Next slide, please. Um, People can, uh, so when we think about the military, uh, it's useful to think about the military in terms of who, who we're in right now, active duty and reserve. Next slide. The military is also veterans, of course. That's why we're here at this conference. Next slide. But the military, um, you know, in my mind anyway, there's sort of this gray area or expanding circles. It's not just the people that are serving. It's also military family members. And in fact, for purposes of um, uh, benefits and so on, military family members might have benefits that accrue from the person that was in the military. Next slide. Or there's also people that work with the military, like Department of Defense civilian employees. Next slide. Or military contractors. Next slide. And, whoa. And by the way, I'm speaking in the mic so that we videotape in the back, not, not uh, because I think you can't hear me. <laughs> uh, so it's also common for people to move from category to category or to be in different categories. So this is not me, but I know somebody who is this. They're a civilian contractor working for the Army, so they're affiliated with the Army in that way. They're a Navy Reserve person. They were former Navy active duty. They're a veteran, and they're also married to the military. So um, this person might have different uh, uh, benefits, different things that come from um, service, depending on all these different roles, you know? and. Uh, I don't think she had five ID cards, but she might have had two or three, depending on uh, what she did there. Okay, next slide. Okay, we covered this, uh, Marshall covered this yesterday, and it'll be covered again today, so we'll, we'll uh, go past this and get on to the, um, get on to the uh, information about credit. So um, some stuff as we're learning in this conference, um, some common military student barriers that I call them, or challenges, or issues, or things that we can help with in college. There's some issues about uh, information getting information about transfer credit, financial aid, and so on. Um, culture, military students sometimes don't feel totally comfortable entering a, a community college or a university culture after serving the military. I myself did not feel very comfortable um, working in college, uh, in a college after working in the military. It's, it, believe it or not, it's a little bit different how the chain of command works and all that stuff, not quite the same. Um, injury trauma, financial uh, issues, and so on. Next slide. Uh, we, in this breakout session, are simply talking about this first part, okay, accurate and complete information about transfer credit. But I wanted to put the slide in here and make the point that all these other things are vital, right? It's, it's, if, 
if the student has absolute, the best information about transfer credit and what courses to take and what courses not to take, none of that's going to matter if this other stuff isn't addressed as well. So, um, so I just want to make the point that it's a complete package. And for those of you who are counselors, I think, um, as you know, when you work with students, you want to um, approach the student as a complete package. They have all these other needs, too. Next slide. Okay, so let's get into the credit part. Next slide. So uh, for purposes of this presentation, I want to think about military credit as just another category of transfer credit. So transfer credit is something that happened in the past. I had some sort of experience somewhere. And then that experience is used later on at a different institution to clear requirements for my degree. So there's a sending institution and receiving institution. Next slide. We usually think of sending institutions as these sorts of things. Either the common, these are the common things that are sending institutions, and these are the, these are the receiving institutions. So for example, um, as an articulation officer, my job is to make sure that our courses from the students, what will be the students' previous college, Miramar College, that those courses fulfill university requirements. And my job is to know exactly what they fulfill and how they fulfill them so that the student can accurately plan their, their education uh, with the help of a counselor. Uh, so this is how we normally operate. This is, our, this is our norm. Next slide. For military students, they may have all those things on the previous slide, but they also have this thing, uh, these sorts of things. They have military credit that accrue from their training or coursework from being in the military, from possibly from their experience in the military, that's work experience. Um, many military students, uh, veterans, uh, have lots of credit from a variety of different institutions that they attended while they were in the military especially nowadays with uh, distance education, with uh, many colleges and universities teaching classes actually on base. In the Navy, there are some uh, times where a college and university teaches classes on ship, so uh, not just on the base, but out underway. Um, students can come to you, you've probably seen this, with lots of credit from lots of different places, okay? So those are all sending institutions for credit. And then uh, military students often take or have the opportunity to take prior learning assessments like CLEP or DSST in addition to the other type of assessments that we see many students take like AP and IB. Next slide. For purposes of uh, transfer, credit from prior institutions can fulfill, um, I said they fulfill degree requirements. It's useful to think about the categories that we're talking about. Okay, one type of category is unit requirements. Unit requirements is the part of your degree that says, in order to get an associate's degree, you need at least 60 units. Or in order to get a bachelor's degree, you need at least 120 units. It's just the number, okay? That's unit requirements. But in addition to just having a number of units, there are other requirements that a student has to fulfill. There's general education or graduation requirements, and there's major, major prep requirements. And as we go down this list, they go from the general to the specific. So unit requirements, to, to satisfy a unit requirement, it just has to be college level coursework, right? To satisfy a GE requirement, you're getting a little more narrow now. It has to be something in social and behavioral sciences if you're trying to clear that GE requirement. Or it has to be something in um, physical sciences if you're trying to clear that requirement. Doesn't mean it has to be a specific course, it just has to be a course that fits into that category. When you get into major or major prep requirements, so at that point, we are talking about specific courses, usually. Uh, so that might be, instead of saying, well, you just need some sort of social science credit, you're saying, look, you need um, the sociology class and contemporary social problems. That is required for this major. So it gets, j just like in all forms of transfer, it gets um, uh, harder sometimes to apply credit to these requirements because they become much narrower as you go down this list. And how we, how we apply the credit is determined by a number of different things. One thing is by institutional policy. So your community college might have a policy that says, look, we're going to apply ACE unit uh, credit as determined by the ACE evaluation at least towards our unit requirements. So my, my college has that policy, my district. So whatever the ACE guide, sa uh, ACE guide says for this student, we will clear the unit requirements for that. We also have policies about GE requirements. Or you might have uh, credit determined by articulation, which in this case is um, basically a prior promise that that credit will apply for all students that have taken that experience. So for example, in my district, uh, we have found that uh, some of our students come uh, to us having taken a Navy school in um, where they cover Microsoft Office stuff, like um, Microsoft Word, Excel, those sorts of things. 
and we have promised, we have made an agreement that any student that's attended that school will clear those requirements for the student's degree if they're majoring in microcomputer applications or something like that. Or um, the transfer credit may fulfill requirements based on an evaluation. So the, the uh, student comes to you with their transcript, their military coursework, and it's evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis just like other transcripts are. Or, I should have put it up here, if uh, beyond all these things, a student might satisfy a coursework by petition. So they might say, yeah, the course I took in the military isn't exactly the same as you have, but I, I would like to petition that it be used in lieu of your course because it, it fills the same purpose. Okay, and that would also be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, no, uh, any questions about that? Because that's sort of the framework of what we're talking about. Yes? I kind of have a couple questions. At our school, we apply the military credits electives. Uh-huh. Only. Unless, like you were saying, they want to petition the department to try to use the credits, which is very rare. Yeah. Um, so the biggest problem that we have is that a lot of times it's actually hurting them to get these electives because uh, not only financial aid is using those and they're being exempt from financial aid because they have too many units, even though it doesn't apply directly to their degree, and they really don't even need electives because they're already taking six or more units. Or the other issue is maybe they are just below the 60 minimum and they have maybe 10 or 11 units that they're enrolled in and they want to get a full-time benefit, but uh, because they have these military credits, if they try to add any of the course <coughs> units for the school, they, they can't use it towards their benefits because they have military units for electives rather than school electives. Did you see what I'm trying to say? I, I do, yeah. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to repeat it or rephrase it for the purpose of the um, camera documentation. Um, so I think what you're saying is uh, at, at your institution, you have a policy about awarding units of credit, um, that first category, for military coursework. But um, as it turns out, students often have lots of units of credit, and it doesn't fulfill anything else. It doesn't fulfill GE requirements or major requirements. So now the student has an abundance of credit without clearing specific requirements that they need. Uh, and there's problems that accrue from that. And um, um, you're right, that's a very common occurrence. I think it happens at more than just your institution. And I think it is, uh, we'll talk about ways that you might find um, uh, ways to use that credit for other purposes uh, as we go along in here. And maybe those are things you could bring back to your institution, um, these ideas about how to use credit to fulfill requirements other than just elective credit. And I think as a state, uh, at least in my field, we've moved now to the part where everyone recognizes that issue. We're no longer really talking about just recognizing military coursework as, as being, you know, college level uh, to clear at least elective requirements. We're kind of already there. Now we're looking at how do, we, how do we use it to clear the actual requirements that a student needs. And as we know, 90% um, or so of our community college students don't need elective units anyway. The, everybody has an abundance of elective mm -hmm. units, right? What, what they need is to fulfill specific requirements towards their educational goal. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. Yes. Um, I take it that list that you put out on the chair or the list of colleges that accept elective credits because I'm from the College of San Mateo and I noticed that our colleges are on there. Actually, all of our colleges are not on there from San Mateo. My question is I know that, that we take the, the D214 for the yes. six PE help. I'm curious as to how some of the colleges So there's a question. So, yeah, so I, I'm going to rephrase it. Um, I, I think you're asking about the list, which we're going to cover a little bit later. I'll tell you what that list is. And then uh, you're also um, commenting that uh, at, at your colleges, they don't accept military credit in the same way that other community colleges yeah, seem to. Yeah, OK. And, and so the question is, how, do, how, do, how is it that some colleges do that and other colleges don't? OK, good. Yep. Are you going to be talking about the legislation? Um, it was mentioned yesterday at the, what, no, I think you can talk about the legislation. Do you know what it is? I can't remember, but I think it's 852 encouraging us to yeah. use the AC standards. I thought you had been involved with that. I, I have been a little bit, yeah. I don't know the exact wording that came out of the end, though. So, yeah, there's new, uh, thank you. So the comment is there's new legislation that encourages colleges to look at how um, military credit is applied. And I have a suggestion 
that I'll get to in a, in a little bit for you to bring back to your college about how that might be done in practice. So um, the legislation says we should do it. Um, um, I'm interested in seeing how we can all do this collectively as a system. Uh, okay, thanks for the question. So, uh, so these are the types of credit we went through. And then for each of these, uh, in this section of the presentation, we're gonna talk about this. What the source of credit is, what documentation you might find from the student, and then the uses and fulfilling requirements. And I think we'll cover um, what, what was just asked, uh, those two questions in that, in that part. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about military training coursework. Next slide. So um, for, uh, for students that go through the military, I, I kind of added this this year in my presentation. This is sort of a typical military training progression. And my example here is sort of in the Navy since that's what I, I know. So virtually everybody that enters the military starts in some form of basic training. And basic training is just, um, it's a way to get the person to become a military person from being a civilian person. So that's where they yell at you and make you do push-ups and you march around and all that stuff. Then after that, students are trained in a military uh, uh, occupation. In, in the Navy, we call that an A school. So that's a, a basic job that you're gonna have in the military. So for example, you might, get, you might uh, wind up being a cook in the Navy and you get trained, you go to culinary school and you get trained as a cook, okay? That's your occupation. And it's sometimes as surprising, I think, to civilian, uh, civilians at the wide range of occupations that we have in the military. There's almost anything you can think of in the civilian world we do in the military. We have electricians, we have plumbers, we have uh, postal workers, I mean, everything. So, um, so there's lots and lots of different occupations. Once this, the um, military member is in that occupation for a while, they then um, often go to a specialty within that military occupation, which in the Navy we call a C school. So um, for example, our, our uh, culinary specialist uh, might go into uh, a school that trains them to um, work for VI, uh, uh, work as someone that helps when VIPs come to town or on, on VIP flights or something like that. So if you're gonna shuttle around um, a government official, that person might specialize in, or if you're gonna work at the White House, on the White House, uh, White House culinary staff, there's a special school for that. And then as you progress in the ranks in the military, you get to the point where you're not the one doing the work anymore, you're the one supervising those who do the work. So you go to supervisory or management training, and, um, and also often people go to something that's a little more like what we do in college um, called professional military education where you're taking a little more theory-based courses, less direct applied training, and it's intended to um, give you this education that's pertinent to being a, a career military person. Also, sometimes people go to training in an additional occupation or specialty. So just an overview of how this works when you're in the military. It's sort of you sort of have a progression in your training just like you have a progression in your job and rank. Next slide. Okay, so this military training or coursework, the source of credit, so the reason that we're, that we're clearing requirements at our colleges is because it's training or education provided by the military to military people. Okay, it's not that they've attended a university or college, they've received training in the military. Because it's training in the military, it is usually career technical, vocational, occupational in nature. Why? because the military is in the business of getting uh, people trained up to do a very applied job. You might want somebody to learn how to drive a tank or fly an airplane or um, uh, do the bookkeeping for a particular um, uh, military agency. It's, uh, it's for a purpose, uh, a very specific purpose. So some examples, basic military training we covered. Air traffic controller school is an example. You're training somebody to be an air traffic controller to, to, uh, at a military airfield or a ship. Or uh, another example is basic still photography school. You're training somebody to be a photographer in the military. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of these schools, uh, but they're virtually all applied, for, uh, career technical type things. Next slide. Okay, the documentation for this, um, the uh, online documentation uh, where you can learn about all these different schools is uh, the ACE guide. Um, so the ACE guide is a standard reference for um, for learning about uh, the, the uh, education that a student acquires in the military. And uh, what ACE is, is it's, this, it, it's, it's not the military, it's a separate organization. They hire civilian professors that work in the field to go out to evaluate the military school and give a recommendation about what these civilian professors think um, uh, ought to be recognized by colleges and universities. So it's a civilian professors translating that military course into civilian ease uh, uh, for us to use in the educational community. 
And when they do that translation, they provide a credit recommendation that's based on um, the way that we recognize credit, based on the Carnegie standard. Uh, handout two is a little more information about, uh, about ACE and how that credit is, um, it, how credit recommendations, the different categories of credit recommendations. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of how to use ACE to get some information. You might have seen this already online. If not, if you just Google ACE, that, uh, that'll pop up. Okay, so this is the online military guide. Next slide. These are our search tools. We can search for courses, that's military courses, or occupations. Next slide. And I'm going to show you an example of this when we get to the student transcript part. Okay, so just as an example, we're going to search for photo in the keyword and see what comes up. Next slide. So here's a list of different military courses that have been evaluated by ACE um, and translated into civilian ease for our use. Uh, notice there is however many there are on here, uh, seven, eight, whatever it is, nine. Uh, there are actually more than nine courses of instruction that exist out there in the military for people to go through to learn how to do photography, but they're not all evaluated by ACE. There's a variety of reasons why that happens. One, if the course of instruction is short enough that the student would not get any units anyway at college, or maybe only one or two, that doesn't seem worth it to spend all the money to send these people out to evaluate it, so they don't do that, okay? Like in, in uh, my squadron, we had people that went through a very short course in photography, um, one per crew, because we used to have to take pictures of things. That course was never evaluated because it was only two weeks or something like that. They, you know, they didn't think it would accrue any units. Also, sometimes there are courses in the military that are um, classified in nature. They have like secret stuff in them. And so they're not gonna have a bunch of civilian professors come and evaluate the secret stuff, right? Because uh, they don't have a clearance to do that. Okay, so these are the ones that ACE did evaluate. And let's look at one of them. Next slide. We'll click on basic still photography school and see what it says. Next slide. <coughs> okay, so once you do that, you get this nice documentation about the school. It tells you, uh, it's got this number on the top of it, which is the military school number. Uh, it tells you about the different versions of the course and where they're offered and how long they take, when they've been offered. So version one, they stopped offering that in 07. Version two, they're continuing after that. Just like our curriculum at the community colleges, we update it regularly and we change course outlines. Sometimes we deactivate courses, we make new courses. The military does that too, so they have these different versions of the courses. Next slide. Uh, at the end of this, it tells you all about the course, which we'll look at a little bit uh, later. And then at the end, it gives you a credit recommendation. This is what this group of civilian professors thought the course should be worth at, uh, at colleges in terms of um, semester credits. Okay, and they've got it broken out by version one and version two. And you can see in this case, they're saying um, three semester units in um, basic photography for the lower division baccalaureate level, three in darkroom procedures, and then they have upper division baccalaureate level uh, credit as well that they're recommending. Next slide. Okay, so that's sort of a background of what's available on the web to look up this stuff. What does a student actually have? Like what, when you're working with a student, what do you see? Well, um, students were, are gonna come to you, they have in the system military transcripts. Used to be, uh, prior to the web, that they would um, generate DD-295, which is a form that um, was an evaluation of learning experiences during the military. So that's sort of like a transcript. Uh, this is obsolete now, but some people might still be coming to the college with it. Other, uh, um, uh, what they use now instead is uh, transcripts. So Army has something called arts. And you know, in the other version, I took it out in this one because um, I, I actually threw a chocolate yesterday at somebody and hit him on the head and I felt bad about it. So I took it out of this slide, but we're a small enough group that I could probably do this. Who would like to use their handout of acronyms to, um, to uh, answer what arts means? To win a valuable prize. AARTS, anyone know offhand? Army American Council on Education Registry Transcripts. All right, there we go. Have a chocolate. You're welcome. I have a few left from yesterday. So, okay, so the operative word in there is transcript. So the military is trying to find a way to, to translate what uh, students do in the military into something that we understand. And we understand this word transcript, right? It means, uh, you know, a record of the student's coursework. Okay, so the Army uses that one. The Air Force uh, does it a little differently. They actually have an accredited community college, just like our community colleges. It's called Community College of the Air Force. It offers regular classes that, community college, that uh, Air Force students can take, and they go ahead and do all the translating for you. So the student 
in the Air Force gets an actual transcript from an accredited college, so you don't have to do as much translating. The Navy and the Marine Corps, not to be outdone by the Army, came up with what they think is a more clever acronym, which is SMART, which stands for? Okay. Thank you. All right. Next slide. Okay, so on these military transcripts, they list these sorts of things. Military course completions, experience, some prior learning assessment results if the military knew about those when the student took them, like if they took them through, um, through the military, or other learning experiences that were not evalu evaluated by A's. You have a handout that's an example smart transcript that shows you these different categories, and we're gonna walk through that for a bit. Next slide. So here's a handout. Uh, it's just an example, it's kind of a, a um, mystery person. And uh, I'm just gonna point out the different sections to, on it. The first section is the military course completions. This would be the closest thing to what we have in the college systems as a transcript. It lists the different training the students took. Next slide. There's a section on military experience, which um, shows not the, not the training or the coursework, but the job experience, what they were doing in their work in the military. Next slide. There's uh, college level test scores, which is these prior learning assessments that the student might have taken in the military. So for example, this student took a CLEP test in Spanish, and it tells us what their score was for the CLEP test. Next slide. And then other learning experiences. These are things that ACE did not evaluate for some reason or another, but they list them there just so you know that the person took them. Next slide. Okay, for military, actually in all these different sections, or at least in the military and the experience section, um, whatever the course was, on the right-hand side, they give you these very military-looking numbers, ACE identifier number and a military course ID. That is the code you can use to go into the ACE guide online to learn more about that, about that experience. Next slide. So if we go back to the web and we type in this number, we knew this person was in the Navy, and we're typing in the ACE ID number right here that appeared on the transcript. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Once we do that, we find um, uh, what they attended. This is the basic military training course that was operative during this period. That's when the student took it. Next slide. Next slide. And then uh, it tells us more about that experience. There's some on the transcript, but if we want to learn more about it, like we want to figure out what they actually l covered in the class uh, and activities and so on, we can use the ACE guide to find that out. That might guide us in our decision making about how to clear college requirements for this experience. And we'll look at some examples in a moment. And on the course exhibit at the bottom, it gives a credit recommendation, like we said before. Next slide. And uh, because ACE knows that that's, that's the basic thing you're looking at is what credit um, you should award, at least the number of units of credit, they've already put it on the transcript. So you don't actually have to look up the credit. It's already here. You don't have to look up the basic description. That's already here. But if you want more in-depth knowledge about the uh, in-depth information about that course, that's what you look up on the web. Next slide. Okay, another form you might see is a DD-214. And this is still, seems to be still used widely um, uh, in, in education. Um, I, I often get questions about DD-214s. The thing about DD-214 is it's not intended to be a transcript. It's not intended to list what the student, what coursework the student took in the military. That's what the, that's what the military transcripts are for. Instead, it's a record of the student's military service and, and a record of their discharge from the military. It lists the time and service. It does list occupational specialties in the military. And it lists at least some military training and coursework. Next slide. This is what it looks like. It's, it doesn't look at all friendly like the transcript one does, right? Uh, but if this is what you have when you're working with a student, if you don't have the transcript, you can glean some information from it that might help you in uh, figuring out how to award credit or, or where, where you can apply credit. Next slide. So for example, uh, my, my district um, awards four units of credit. It clears our two PE requirements and our health ed requirement for six months or more of military service. The thinking there is if the student was in for at least six months, then that means they went through some form of basic training. And in basic training, uh, they have to do push-ups and running, get yelled at, so that's a PE part. And then they also um, learn about health and themselves and develop character and that sort of stuff, and that's the health ed part. So, um, so in my district, because we do that, you could actually just use this part, which lists the total amount of time that the student had been in the military, and use that to clear those requirements without the need for a transcript if you don't have one on hand. Next slide. It also lists some um, jobs that the person did and how long they did those jobs. 
Next slide. There's also a block for military education, so it, it has course numbers in here. Now notice this does not have that nice code that you can type into the ACE guide, that's on the transcript. But if you were trying to look this up in the ACE guide and this is all you had, you could look at the words on here and type those into the keyword block. So like we could type in Naval Aviation Maintenance Officer in the keyword block and that would pop up the school for us. So we could find it that way. Next slide. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Well, can you go, go back one, please? 14, it, I mean, do you use that to award credit without a transcript? I mean, in our school, you have to have official transcripts. Now, the ACE transcripts counts as an official transcript. I don't know how you could get around the requirements of having an official transcript uh, to award credit. Okay, so the question is, um, can you use the DD-214 to award credit, or do you have to have an official transcript from, um, uh, from the military? And I think probably that varies by college and by district. I believe in my district, I'm not an evaluator, but I believe in my district they will use the two DD-214 to clear at least the minimum that we clear for yeah, six months of military yeah. service. Yeah. yeah, we do, but I don't know that for the schools and stuff that, that we would use that, that they would allow that because you do sort of need an official transcript, at least at our school. Yeah, so the comment is uh, you would probably need an official transcript to actually award credit based on the schools. And I think that's probably true for most districts. Um, well, I'd say it's been a long-standing practice with our school and our transfer schools, our CSUs, that um, we have used only the DD-214 and actually award credit for area of PE. Right, well, that's so what he just said. Yeah, but for PE and, and health ed, we use the DD-214. I'm talking about what you just referred to in terms of the schools, aviation, and whatever else is on there to, for elected credits or whatever. Okay, so that um, just for purposes of the recording, so the comments were um, uh, many schools are still using the DD-214 to clear things like area E, PE, health ed credit. Uh, if you want to go more in depth than that, you would probably need the transcript because that's the official record and that's got the unit values on it and everything else. So I would agree with that, and I would, I would add to that that I think. Um, it is definitely best practice to use a transcript uh, for anything beyond just the record of military service. And I don't want to generalize this or say that it's always like this, but um, part of the reason I'm saying that is from my own experience, um, this is mine, and uh, um, this stuff in these two blocks was just the guy that was discharging me asked me what I did in the military. And he gave me this list and said, did you do any of these jobs? I'm like, yeah, I did this one for a while, and yeah, I did that thing, and this sounds good, you know, I didn't really do that, but let's put it on because it sounds good for my resume and blah, 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 you know. So who, kn who knows what the, how accurate all that is. But the transcript is definitely going to be accurate because it comes from the training records of the schools. Yeah. How difficult is it to get the transcript? I'm told on the student side it's not difficult at all, or it's gotten easier, let me say that. So I think there's a web form that, um, that you can fill out to get it on the student side. They can get an unofficial copy, I've got my own, um, but of course we would want the official copy to get sent directly from the military. And um, does anyone else in the room know, I got asked that question yesterday and I haven't done it, I haven't done it since the web's been invented and grown. <laughs> Has any, does anyone know, has anyone done it? Yeah. Well, the student just requests that their military transcripts get sent to the school and like our census, we'll send it to you electronically. Mm -hmm. And we just have to access their website pull down the student. I'm sorry, very, said, so who, who would send it to you? The, the student would request right. that their military transcript, I'm speaking mostly of arts, is what I've seen, I school it's not transcripts. But when the student, they go on their arts transcript website and order their transcripts to be sent to school and it's sent to the school electronically, you'll get a notification saying you have an art transcript that filed you have sent and you just go to the link and access the transcript. Okay, so the answer is uh, the student has a way to go on the web and order the transcript and it gets sent immediately uh, electronically to the school. You have to create an account from the, the arts website. Um, I believe you have to sign up MOU you just have to, to um, verify that you are an employee of the college and then arts will give you an access, their contact will give you an access. Okay. Okay, thanks. And the clarifying, uh, the background information that is the college has to pre-set this up first with arts or smarts to make sure that they are certifying that they're an official educational institution that uh, arts or smarts can send the transcript to. Okay, thank you. All right, next slide. Okay, so how do you use, so now we know where to find the credit, how to learn about it, how to learn what the student did. How would we use for fulfilling requirements? Well, 
Um, we kind of mentioned before, um, you can use this to fulfill unit requirements. So that's just saying that the credit counts towards the total number of units you need for a degree. Uh, and I, I believe in California, most community colleges, uh, al probably almost all community colleges do this. Some still don't. Um, but we'll talk about how we might be able to standardize that more. So uh, how, would you, how would you award unit requirements? Well, you would um, probably do it as recommended by the ACE Guide. That's what we do. But you'd have to think about which categories of ACE Guide credit is appropriate because that credit is divided into things like you know, basic skills level, career technical, vocational level that's non-baccalaureate, lower division baccalaureate, upper, level, upper division baccalaureate, and graduate level. So depending on how you apply credit from anywhere else, you would want to look at that level, right? So for com community colleges, we'd probably be looking at the associate degree level and the lower division baccalaureate level. Yep. Uh, well, that, that brings up that financial aid issue because I had a student who somehow their, their ACE transcript got sent to the financial aid office and the financial aid office um, looked at all the units. I mean, there were units on there for active listening and they used all the units and because financial aid uses all units after high school, um, whether it's accredited or non-accredited or whatever, and completely, you know, uh, this, uh, this person was no longer eligible for financial aid. So, so, so it's a really iffy area to give them credit and I don't think that we're, that we can pick and choose. We can for graduation, we can for transfer, but once we We've, we've opened that door, um, then it impacts their financial aid, and, and a vast majority of veterans would no longer be eligible for financial aid. So I recommend, as a counselor, that they not ask for any evaluation until they're ready to graduate, because it is, it is going to be So, okay. So the comment is, uh, is that um, it's possible that financial aid might look at an ACE transcript and see that there's all this credit being recommended, uh, and they might choose to apply it all, even if the college doesn't have the policy to apply it all. There were a couple of other hands on that, and I see people going, no, that's not how it works. Um, you know, this isn't a financial aid session, so maybe let's address that at the, well, at the it's end. it's not a financial aid session, but on the other hand, it is a session on applied credit. And yeah, it is. A, and it, how is it going to benefit a student if it's not applied towards what they're majoring in, and it's going to take money yeah, from them? Yeah, so the comment is, um, uh, although it's not a financial aid session, we're talking about applying credit, and uh, it will definitely affect the student if the credit is applied really widely. I, I think my um, my response to that is going to be that uh, we want to be in, we want to be sure that we're doing that we're applying the credit from the military transcript in the same way we would apply credit from any other source. So, for example, if a student came to you and had documented the fact that they had worked as an auto mechanic for 10 years in the industry would your college award a bunch of credit for their work experience in the industry? No. Okay, neither would mine. But the ACE Guide has a, has a category that is called um, experience, military experience, and they recommend a bunch of credit based on the student's military experience. If your college does not award credit for job experience for someone who worked in an auto shop, you also naturally would not award job credit for someone that worked in the military. You'd be awarding credit for the training they went through, but not for the work experience. So, um, you know, if, if the financial aid office is using a different practice than what the, the policy of the college is, um, I think probably that's something that needs to get worked out internally. I agree that there is an issue, though, that even without that, students often have a lot of credit that they, that they come with. And, and what we want to try to do is find a way to apply it to requirements. But yeah. that's not an internal thing. That's a, that's a federal guideline. And the federal guidelines, they even count they even count proprietary schools, which don't have any accreditation, and they count those units. They count all kinds of units that we would never apply. Okay, so the comment is, regardless of what the college does, the federal government has a different policy for federal financial aid, and even in, and they, they'll accept everything. And I, hear, I see people disagreeing with that in the, in the audience. Yes? Regionally accredited institutions. So if they're not regionally accredited, such as um, traditional, some of these 
traditional schools would not accept that. And if they really have um, excess units from military or other accredited, accredited um, institution, they can apply for um, the, the appeal for time yeah. frame limit. Yeah. But um, we don't take credits from none of Okay, and it looks like uh, at least three people in the audience are saying at their colleges, uh, the financial aid office mirrors the policy of the college in terms of how it counts the credit. So it sounds like there might be some differences in financial aid policy, financial aid office practices among the colleges, and perhaps that's something you can take back to ask about. Okay, it's a great discussion. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we can use military and training coursework for unit requirements. Many people do that. Um, GE, you might be able to use it for GE or graduation requirements. We already talked about health and PE or area E for CSU, which we'll talk about in a moment. In, uh, in the case of the transcript we just looked at, that student, um, well, not that transcript, but if a student had gone to maybe a language school or something like that in the military, you might be able to clear that. There's a variety of different GE areas that you might be able to clear. You're probably not gonna be able to clear something like English composition or mathematics you know, physical science, unless the student had some really specific training, okay? It's more likely that you clear area E in some of this stuff. Next slide. Okay, the CSU um, in the past few years um, has come out with an overarching policy for the, whole, uh, for the whole CSU system. They used to have this policy written in a couple different places and it wasn't well recognized and they've kind of put it all together now. So their policy at the CSU is every CSU will, um, will recognize uh, units of credit as recommended by the ACE guide for lower division baccalaureate credit or higher. So they're not gonna do associate degree level credit, but they will do lower division baccalaureate credit or higher. And that applies, that's just like any form of credit. So it applies towards the minimum 60 units you need to transfer. It is part, uh, if it's lower division, it's part of the 70 unit cap for lower division. And it applies to the minimum 120 units to graduate. Okay, so, so that every campus in the CSU system is required to do this. I've heard people say um, in these presentations that, well, my CSU campus doesn't do it, or there's no, you know, they don't have a process in place, or it seems like my students aren't getting that credit. Um, I, I understand that our experience in community colleges at different CSU campuses are at a different stage in implementing this rule. <laughs> So some of them might not have a process in place to do it, or some of them only do it by appeal, or you have to make a special phone call or something. Um, but this is, in fact, the policy. It's an executive order, and it's been confirmed by the CSU Chancellor's Office that this is their policy. Okay, also, um, you can, we do have a method to make sure that every CSU clears area E for students that have military credit. Now, it's the case right now in the CSU system that they're not required to do that. So some CSU campuses for their native students that are veterans, they clear area E for their native students with military credit, and some CSU campuses do not do that for their native students, okay? However, when, when polled by the CSU Chancellor's Office, every CSU campus indicated that they would accept our certification to clear CSU GE area E, regardless of whether they clear it themselves for their native students. So that means for us, we can clear, if your college does this, if your college says, I'll clear area E for military credit, that certification will be accepted by the CSU system. So, um, so that's great. So now we've just found one area, at least, where we know for sure we can use military credit for something other than just elective credit because we know that we can use it to certify CSU GE area E and that will be accepted by every CSU. Okay, next slide. Yes. Um, regarding the last slide there, I personally haven't had any experience, like let's say for example, there's a communications course that's been recommended by ACE that can facilitate speech or a debate. I would feel very hesitant at clearing area A1 for transferring that. Has anyone done that? Or is that, because it says right there, as recommended by ACE for lower division baccalaureate credit or higher that applies to transfer or graduation requirement. Okay, so uh, the question is about, um, using, can we use uh, ACE guide military credit to clear something other than CSU GE area E on the CSU GE pattern, like area A1 or something like that? And I, I believe the answer is no right now. The CSU has not allowed us to do that. And I, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on this. All I'm talking about in this part is unit requirements. Okay, so there's, when we think about, when we think about transfer and we think about what the student needs to do, there's, th Think about it in terms of what the requirements are for them to graduate, right? There's a unit requirement. You gotta have at least 120 units of something uh, 
and as long as you have above 120 units, you're done with that requirement. We don't have to worry about units anymore, right? Now we go to a different category, which is, did you get all the checks in the block for GE? And then we go to a different category, did you get all the checks in the block for your major requirements? So in this part, all I'm talking about is the units of credit. So they have agreed to accept it for units of credit towards 120 or 60 units. Doesn't mean it fulfills anything necessarily, it just can count towards the 60 units. Are you following, you following me? Okay. Yeah, and then as a separate matter, they have also agreed to accept our certification of Area E. So that, that part at least we have. Next slide. Okay. So then we get down to the most specific w thing that we need to clear a student's education, uh, you know, clear a student's requirements, which is major or major prep requirements. Most of the time, these are specific courses, right? If you're a sociologist, you gotta have introduction to sociology, you gotta have contemporary social problems, you gotta have statistics, right? Very specific content in those classes. So um, this area is probably the least fruitful area for us to look at applying military credit, but there still might be some opportunity to do it. And so I'm going to uh, share a couple of ways you might do that on your campus. One thing is, um, uh, if the student is majoring in something related to their military training what they or occupation, what they did in the military, you might be able to use that credit to clear your requirements. So for example, if the student was a diesel mechanic in the military and you have a diesel technology program and the student wants to get in that program, you could look at the ACE guide um, and through one of those methods we listed before, through maybe evaluations or petition, you could use military training as per the ACE guide to clear something like the intro to diesel mechanics course or maybe the engine course or maybe the shop safety course. There might be a lot of things we can clear um, because the student is majoring in something that they've learned already in the military. So that's, that's an area I think to explore more. So for instance, like I mentioned before on my campus, we can do that for students that are majoring in our microcomputer applications program because we, we have already evaluated through ACE and through documentation from the schoolhouse itself all the stuff the student learned about Microsoft Office in this training program and we can use it to clear a bunch of the requirements for our, for our program related to that. Uh, also, in some, in some majors, not in all, but sometimes you come across a major where as part of the requirements for the major, there is a list of restricted electives. So that's where the, the faculty have said, look, I want the student to take these core classes in the major and then take six units of any of this. And there's like 10 classes listed, something like that. Well, what they're looking for there usually is more breadth in the field. And it doesn't necessarily matter what the breadth is because there's all these different options. The point is to have more experience in the field. So in that case, you might be able to use um, a military course in that breadth requirement, in that restricted elective requirement. Now when doing that, when you're, um, it would probably have to be done through petition. And when you're doing that in the petition, when the student's doing that, I think um, the important point to bring out with the uh, classroom faculty member that the petition's going to, the department, is look, we're not petitioning to substitute this for a specific course, we're petitioning for this to be used to fulfill the intent of the restricted elective. Okay, the intent is a broadening experience. This is a broadening experience. We're, we're trying to get it to work for the intent of that requirement. Okay, for any of these things though, it, in the past it was quite a challenge to find sufficient document for, for doing this, for articulation evaluations, whatever you're doing, um, because uh, the ACE guide usually would just describe what the course was and then it would give a credit recommendation. And there wasn't a whole lot of detail about the content in the course. Uh, and, if, and certainly when we're looking at a major, major prep requirements, we're really concerned about content because we're trying to make sure it's the same or similar enough to what we teach. Uh, but uh, ACE has now um, changed their procedures such that when the professors go out to evaluate this course, they're looking at more in-depth content now and they're posting that to the ACE guide. So it's much more helpful now. Next slide. So for example, in our basic still photography course, now what they're doing, next slide, is they have this whole section on learning outcomes. And you know it still doesn't look a whole lot like our course outline, but it's better than it used to be. So this is sort of like the outline of topics or the student learning objective section in the, um, in the course outline. So uh, it'll say, uh, can you go back one, oh, sorry. sorry. So it'll say, for example, uh, the student can use a variety of cameras, lenses, and other photographic equipment. Um, they learn procedures for recording ceremonial, investigation, investigative, medical, blah, 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 documentation. Uh, and they also process, print, and copy all types of black and white and color photographs. Okay, so that is a lot more like what we would see in a course outline. That sort of content, which has been, evaluate, which has been determined by professors who work in photography, that that's what they're doing, 
Um, that's the sort of stuff that an instructional faculty member would need to know before clearing a course requirement. Okay, and that's in the ACE guide. Next slide. There's also instructional methods, uh, which is another part of our course outline that sometimes our instructional faculty are very um, uh, concerned about as well. Next slide. Yeah. Given that particular um, course that you're using, basic photography, um, would you give it a course equivalent of, say, your photography one, or photography 100? Yeah, so the question is, uh, in this particular case, would we assign this as an equivalent to our Photography 100? And I get to sidestep that question because we don't teach photography at my school and I know virtually nothing about it, sorry. I just pulled this up because it applied to me. But I will give you an, an analogy uh, for um, like a Microsoft Excel course that the student took in the military. You know, It doesn't say Microsoft Excel, it says something else. But we do, in fact, uh, uh, clear the specific course. So we say this is the same as our Microsoft Excel course. Well, the reason why I'm asking this particular course, and if there's any other counselors, if you would give it, what did you say? Uh, photography 22. 22 elementary photography. Yeah, is that a CSU transferable? Uh, area C1 course? It's not a, it's not a it's C1. Not a C1. Okay, so the question is, um, w would you use this to clear a specific course? And some people in the audience would use it to clear the intro photography course. Um, I do want to warn you, you know, when you do that, um, w since we're a community college, we're clearing the requirements for our degree. We don't necessarily, that doesn't obligate any other school to clear the requirements for their degree. So we have to, you know, we have to think about how that's going to work if, th if the student wants to transfer. Next slide. Okay, we'll briefly go through military experience. Um, is there anyone here that is in an institution that awards credit for military experience, for, for experience, job experience, work experience, anything like that? Okay. So if a student uh, was employed in the past before coming to the college, you might look at that and you have a way to translate that into credit that you award at the yeah, college. Training in college. Okay. Okay, maybe in specific uh, um, uh, fields. Okay. So what this is, is um, it's work experience. It's what the student did in their job in the military. <laughs> And um, the way it's broken out in the, in the ACE guide and in the student's transcript is uh, it shows what they did, the occupation, and then it shows the level at which they did it, which is their rank, okay? So for example, in the Navy, you have someone who's an electronics technician, so they worked on electronics, shipboard electronics, first class, that's a particular rank in the Navy, okay? Or in the Army, you have a construction equipment operator, so it's someone that drove bulldozers and cool big devices, a specialist, that's a particular level, a rank in the Army. Or in the Marine Corps, a military policeman, that's a cop just like our cops, a uh, staff sergeant, that's a particular rank. Okay, so it's an occupation and rank is how they do this. Next slide. It's documented on the DD-214 and on the military transcripts, just like the other learning is. And just like translating military courses, you can translate military experience using the occupations search tool on the ACE guide. Next slide. So for example, here's our sample transcript. We're now in the military experience section. This person's occupation was aviation support equipment technician. Aviation support equipment is that stuff um, that they plug into airplanes to like start engines or give them electricity, that sort of thing. So this person did that job and they were at the rank of AS1. Next slide. So uh, there's the occupation, cleverly circled. There's the ACE guide credit recommendation. If you know that you award credit for experience, you might just use this. You might not have to go to the ACE guide online. Next slide. There's the ACE identifier, just like in our other example. Next slide. So we use the ACE identifier. We go to search occupations. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, we select, next slide. We select Navy enlisted and we type in that ACE ID number. Next slide. And we get the uh, exhibit from the ACE guide. And this is the um, military experience exhibit, not the training, because this is a person's job. And notice that there's these different levels. And these are, for the Navy, AS is an indication of the occupation, and then the number or letter after that is the rank. So how far along did they progress in that occupation? Next slide. So our person was an AS1, and we saw that on their transcript. So here's the recommendation for AS1. Next slide. Okay, there's where it is. Next slide. There's where it is. All right, next slide. Okay, uh, military experience might be used in fulfilling all these different kinds of requirements, depending on the policy of your uh, college. 
So you might award unit requirements if you award credit for experiential learning for, for others, if that's part of your college uh, uh, processes, and you would do that for military students, of course, just like you would do it for civilian students. Um, you might possibly use it to clear GE or graduation requirements. Like for us, we don't look for a specific course that the student took to clear our health ed and PE requirement. We simply look to see if the student had experience in the military, and we assume everyone in the military, I think rightly so, um, could clear these things with, with that uh, experience. In the major, it's possible that you might have a major that has an internship or work experience requirement. There are, there are majors like that. And in that case, you might use military experience to fulfill that requirement for the major, right? Um, uh, uh, you would just clear that requirement because the student's already done work in the field. Next slide. So notice, uh, I'm sorry, go back one. So notice in all these, I'm, I'm, because as we've said, students usually have a ton of units. Usually they're recognized by the community colleges. They're all recognized by the CSUs. So where we want to push is to find ways to clear this stuff so that those units are worth something other than just elective credit. Yes, Mitch. Can I go back to the photography class? Just for sure. If I'm using a transcript, say, from Central Texas College, and I evaluate a photography course as being equivalent to what our photography course is, that is ASU requirements you want, why would I not use the ACE transcript? Yeah, I think the question is, if I'm using it, community colleges, let me make, I'm going to rephrase this question. Tell me if I'm rephrasing it right. Community colleges have been delegated the power to use pass along in certifying CSU general ed requirements. So we can take courses from outside California, determine that they're equivalent to our course, and then certify a particular GE field uh, when we do GE certification, and that must be accepted by the CSU system. Why can't we do that with military credit as well? Is that your question? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I don't know the answer to that question, and I'm gonna answer it with two different thoughts. One thought is, in one way, you would think that we would be able to, right? It's military credit, it's, as long as it's baccalaureate level, it's recognized by the CSU system, couldn't we just decide if it really is equivalent to our course that we do it? Uh, on the other hand, um, the, the institution that the student got the credit from is not the same as a college or university institution. And I think we would be very um, uh, conservative in exercising our delegated power of clearing the CSU system's requirements. Uh, we would have to be, uh, we would want to be very careful in how we decide to use that power for something that doesn't come from an accredited institution. In a case like that, I mean, practically what I would do is just call the receiving institution and ask them if that's okay. Did you have uh, something on that, too? Yeah, so Dan's comment is a regionally accredited would be the big trigger. And I, I think it would be a big deal to the CSU system, too. But let me say this. The, the CSU system in recent years has been very interested in, in doing this. I mean, we're working hand in hand with them on this stuff. In some ways, they're ahead of us on it. So if you, if you come up with an example that you think a military course could, in fact, clear a CSU GE requirement, um, I think they would be open to figuring out a way to make that work. So, and I also think instead of just working with your CSU, if you could let that be known in the community, like in, among the AOs in the community that work on this, that would give us some ammunition to go to the CSU system and start working with them on institutionalizing it, okay? So if you find those examples, if you find cases where military coursework really will, looks like it really should clear some GE requirements, let it be known so that we can start moving forward in that to see if it would work with the CSU. Yep. Yeah, the question is, has anyone thought about CID numbering with this? Um, yes, uh, people have thought about CID numbering with it. Um, I don't think anything official is in place yet, and of course CID is still being built for its original purpose. Um, but um, there does seem to be the possibility in the future that maybe CID would be used for this. Uh, in my mind, it depends, w we, we have to look at the overlap, because right now CID is mostly intended for transfer coursework, right? Um, and the majority of um, uh, military training is occupational in nature, not transfer in nature. Uh, some of it is, some of it could be, like photography, but, but much of it is not, so we'd have to see what the value is. But people are definitely talking about it. Yeah. yeah. I did attend a workshop at um, Cal State uh, Dominguez Hills uh, this past fall. I don't know if anybody else attended that one. And so I believe it is the intent of Cal State to are you talking about Compass? Uh, pardon me? Are you talking about the Compass program? Uh, 
I can't remember who it was, but it was a workshop ported between ACE and the Cal States. Yeah, I was at that too. Okay, so the comment is um, the Cal States are definitely interested in looking at how to use ACE credit uh, as evidenced by the, um, by the ACE people coming to the Compass workshop. And uh, Compass itself is a way to move a little more towards um, more applied or experiential learning and clearing GE requirements. So, um, so yeah, I think they're I think they're definitely open to it. If we if we the CSU system find examples where we think it ought to be used, we really want to use those. We really want to share that with the CSU system because I think they're on board. Right now it's just like well, case by case method as opposed to going to a system. -wide. It sounds like they've done system wide on uh, area E. But for the other areas, I think it's going to take a lot more dialogue. Yeah, the comment is uh, case by case on this versus system wide. And it seems like system wide on area E, everything else is case by case. That's where we are right now. And part of the problem is because there's such a vast number of military courses out there, it's not like you can, it's not like you can go in and evaluate all, you know, however many there are, 10,000 of them to find out which ones are going to clear which requirements. You know, we really have to. I think the best way to do that is to see it arise from the students themselves that are coming to us and find the areas that are fruitful for us to, to make that progress. Yeah, Ashley. This definitely ties in, I think, to our discussion that on September 20th, I think, of this year, um, Governor Brown signed AB 2462. And that tasked the Chancellor's Office with by July of 2015 to determining the course credits uh, and specific courses for military experience transfers. So I think that's going to definitely help some of this in streamlining from, from the chancellor's office perspective. And in previous versions of that bill, they, it didn't also include workforce experience. It was edited out of the bill in the final version. Um, but I know that there is some interest in, in running legislation this next session to include that. Okay, thanks. So the comment is about the recent bill being passed. I'm, I'm going to move forward because we're almost out of time. So um, we'll have more questions at the end. And if you want to come and ask me questions, we'll, we'll do that at the end. All right, next slide. All right, so I do want to talk about military-friendly institutions. Next slide. So these are um, easy, relatively easy. They're, they're accredited institutions just like us. So everything, everything, students get transcripts and all that stuff. It's just like any other school. There's different types. Might be a regular old civilian college or university or something that's affiliated with the military. Next slide. Uh, so um, a military-friendly institution, the way we use that term, it might be a military-affiliated institution like an academy or a school with a large military population or a school offering courses on base like my college does. Um, next slide. Um, and some of these are, m many of these are members of something called the SOC Consortium. Next slide. So the SOC Consortium is this um, group of institutional members that basically promise to be nice to military and veteran students, to do things that help them um, uh, progress towards a degree. Uh, so by what I mean by being nice is they agree to a set of military-friendly principles and criteria. And I've included as handout three the list of institutions in California that have joined SOC. That's what that list is, okay? So your institution might be among it if you've agreed to these principles and you've signed the form saying we promise to be nice to military and veterans, um, then you're on that list. Next slide. Um, this, is a, uh, this is what the website looks like and you can go to this if you want to look into becoming a SOC consortium member. It tells you what the commitments are that you have to agree to. They're things like being reasonable in transfer of credit, um, limited to no more than 25% of the degree requirements at the institution. Um, most of these, I think, almost all community colleges already meet, so we're, we're already military friendly. It might just be a matter of certifying it. You have to give credit for military training experience as per the ACE guide. You have to give credit for at least one um, uh, prior learning assessment like CLEP. Next slide. When you become a SOC member, uh, SOC consortium member, you get a nice little uh, page in their book uh, that is available to military people saying, hey, look, not that you have to go here, but here are a bunch of schools that promise to be nice to you if you move back and forth uh, in, in transfer. Next slide. Okay, so the documentation that a student would have is official transcripts, maybe articulation agreements. There's a special type of articulation that's open to some SOC members called SOC DNS articulation. It stands for Degree Network System. And this is kind of like CID. You know how CID is this number, and we propose courses to CID, and if they get approved, that means that um, it's bilateral that our course works for every other requirement, every other course that has a number and their courses work for our courses that have that number. So it's the same thing for SOC. They're organized by disciplines and networks. 
Um, and there's also a student degree guarantee component to it. Next slide. So the way this works is a student goes to a home college where they want to get their degree from and they sign a contract with that college saying, if I take your course requirements, you're going to award me this degree. And if that college is in the SOC DNS network, then the student might get transferred to another location because they're in the military, they get sent around all the time. So they can take coursework at other colleges or they can take things like um, military credit or CLEP credit and it's used to clear requirements at the home college. Next slide. That's what the agreement looks like. We're not going to go through it today, but there it is. Next slide. Okay, so here's an example, just real quick. Let's say the student wants to get a, Mir a degree from Miramar as a home campus, since we're so well known throughout the state and everybody wants to get Miramar degrees, of course. So uh, to get their degree from us in their administration of justice program, they have to take our ADJU 230, which is constitutional law. But now the student's getting transferred to Hawaii. Okay, bummer. How can that student complete Miramar's requirement? Next slide. So their home college is Miramar, they're going to Hawaii, uh, they still need to get their degree from Miramar, what do they take in Hawaii? Next slide. So we go to this handy dandy SOC degree network system handbook, next slide, and we look up Miramar College and here are all our courses that we have articulated in these network systems to the um, SOC DNS course number. It's just kind of like CID, it's got this little code, next slide. We find constitutional law on the list, there it is, it's code LW011A. We scribble that on the palm of our hand, and then we flip to another part of the book, and we find LW011A, there it is, and then we scroll down the list until we find a likely college that the student could attend. Next slide. We find Honolulu Community College. Their course is HA220, and it's articulated to the same SOC DNS category, so we know that we are obligated to accept their course, and they are obligated to accept our course, okay, because we've articulated through this bilateral system. Next slide. All right, so there's the answer. The student can take Honolulu Community College's AJ220. Next slide. Okay, so we would, we would use this credit just like we do any other kind of credit because it's from regular accredited institutions. Next slide. All right, and finally, we'll go through prior learning assessments. Next slide, please. Uh, so the source of credit here is a subject matter competency that's demonstrated through an examination, like AP or IB, we're familiar with those. Um, CLEP and DSST are some exams that military members often take. Next slide. It's documented on the military transcript, which is handy for us, if the student took it through the military or through the uh, VA, I imagine. Next slide. We can also get the score report from the testing agency or the student can order it. Next slide. Next slide. And uh, how do we use these? Well, just like we might use AP or IB, you might choose to use them to fulfill unit requirements, GE requirements, or major requirements. Uh, when you're making this decision on your campus, it might be your curriculum committee that makes this decision, it might be your academic senate, um, it's nice to have some documentation for them to help them figure out how to use this credit. It's much better to do this with, with information than in a vacuum. And um, fortunately, the SOC system has come up with a way to help you get information about uh, what they think, their, their professors that evaluated this, what they think you ought to award or that a college might consider awarding. Next slide. So it's called the SOC DNS Credit Evaluation Supplement, and it translates all sorts of different kinds of credit into um, SOC DNS course categories, that course number that we just saw an example of. Next slide. So for example, here's the CLEP table. There's a bunch of different tables. They've done the work for us in figuring out what they think CLEP works for in terms of their SOC DNS categories. Next slide. So notice, for example, American government, they think it's worth three units and it should clear um, this uh, SOC DNS course category number, PO077A or B. Next slide. And uh, that, that we can use to translate into our courses. Also, the CSU system has done an evaluation of CLEP credit, and they've, they've come up with how they're going to use it to clear their unit and GE requirements. And um, I think this is pretty powerful for us because if our number one transfer destination uh, system-wide is using CLEP credit in a particular way, then why wouldn't we also use CLEP credit in the same way? And the articulation officers statewide have, have been pushing for this for a couple of years, and I think most community colleges are now mirroring what the CSU does. Notice that the American government CLEP test is on here, and then it clears the appropriate category and the appropriate number of units, just like the SOC DNS supplement suggested that it would. Next slide. All right, I have a best practices part, but it is now 10.15, and that's when we're supposed to end, right? Okay, so let's do uh, any last minute questions before we end.
the best practices is going to be stuff that we already talked about here, which is clear area E, um, make sure, uh, try to get a policy for awarding credit, and um, possibly designating a counselor on your campus to be the veterans counselor and so on. Okay, there were some great questions during the session. Oh, thank you. <laughs>